we will continue on from where we left off last class period. So last class period, we had just finished going through the planets. And so we've gone through Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and learn some details about them. The last clicker question asked about moons. Which of those planets have moons? All but the first two is the easiest one way to articulate it. All but, all but the two closest to the sun. Which ones have large sized moons? It's a harder question. Which ones have large moons? The, the ones out there are called Jovian or Gas Giant. Well, Gas. Gas Giant. It's, it's actually, Earth has a large moon. You see it all the time. Mars has two moons, but they're not large. Jupiter has the four Galilean moons. And then Saturn has Titan. And Neptune has Triton. I believe that's the list of large moons in the solar system. So then if you were to ask us that question, would you just want us to list the, the name of the planets or the name of the moons? I wouldn't ask you to name the moons. That's a little more than I'm looking for you to know at this point. But I would want you to know which ones have the larger, you know, by large, I mean ones with enough mass that they've formed themselves into a nice sphere. Now, Pluto. Oh, one more question. Two more questions. Which of the moons have an atmosphere? Which moons, or not moons, excuse me. Which planets have an atmosphere? You know, with the moons, you're like, really? I don't remember talking about atmospheres on moons. Um, which planets have atmospheres? Okay, you can say Mars has an atmosphere. It's about one one hundredth as thick as ours. So it's a very, very thin atmosphere, but it's there. So it's accurate to say Mars has an atmosphere. It's inaccurate to say it has no atmosphere. Okay, so Mars, what else? Earth, it has an atmosphere that's just as thick as ours. Okay, moving on. I expected Danny to come up with an easy answer here. All but Mercury. All the planets but Mercury have an atmosphere. Venus has a very thick atmosphere. Mercury has no atmosphere. And what about the gas ones? Well, the gas ones by the name tells you there's an atmosphere. There's not a solid surface there for you to step on, but there's an atmosphere. So there's some interesting things. Now, what was the last question I was going to ask you? Densities. What can you tell me about the densities of the planets? The, the inner ones, the rocky ones, have densities that are above three. The gas ones are below two. Right, so the, the gas ones are gassy, and the rocky ones are rocky, and that's where the densities are. One more thing that we did not talk about that I really should is magnetic fields. The Earth has a magnetic field that we measure and we interact with all the time, right? Compasses use the Earth's magnetic field. Mars has some frozen remnants of magnetic fields, but no planet-wide magnetic field. Venus has no magnetic field. So we've got some different magnetic field things going on here. We can say that Mars used to have a magnetic field, but it's, it's frozen now. Its magnetic field is dissipating. Um, Venus, the conjecture is that it has the things we need as far as rotation, even though it's rotating backward really slowly. And it has, clearly it's going to have to have a molten core because it's really hot on the outside and it's still going to be cooling from formation from all of the energy of stuff falling in. And so it must be that it doesn't have the convection, the third part that we wouldn't talk about normally in a class like this if it wasn't for Venus. 
If we go out to the other planets, we go out to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, do you suppose they have magnetic fields? No, that's a do you suppose? You might be wrong. Okay, we have an answer of no. You might say, well, it's, it's not a liquid and it's not a conductor. But the thing is, with something like Jupiter and Saturn, even though you will never go from falling in and splashing when you hit a, a liquid surface, it gets thicker and thicker until you have liquid hydrogen. If you compress it more, it's liquid metallic hydrogen, which is a conducting material. And because these planets are rotating, and actually rotating pretty quickly, they make very strong magnetic fields because of that liquid metallic hydrogen swirl. So Jupiter and Saturn have really strong magnetic fields. Jupiter's is extremely strong. If you go further out, Uranus and Neptune are a different kind of beast. Uranus and Neptune don't have the conditions necessary to create liquid metallic hydrogen in them. But they still have magnetic fields. And the magnetic fields are bizarre. You know, our magnetic field is pretty much aligned with the Earth's rotational axis. It's not exactly aligned. And our magnetic field does have the North Pole wandering around a little bit. You probably didn't know that. But the North Magnetic Pole, which is at the South Geographic Pole, um, because, they, because of how they named the North Pole of a magnet, they named it. The North Pole of a magnet seeks the Earth's North Pole. And then they learned that the North Pole of a magnet seeks the opposite pole, hence it's seeking the Earth's magnetic South Pole. But the Earth's magnetic poles wander around a little bit. They don't stay fixed on the surface of the Earth. But they're pretty close to the rotational axis. On Uranus and Neptune, they're not close. It, say this is the rotational axis, and this is the center. The magnetic field might be doing something like this, not going through the center and at a pretty significant angle away from the rotational axis. And there's a lot more variation in the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune. And so in trying to understand, the scientists have come to the conclusion, based on this evidence, based on seeing the very off-kilter magnetic field and the fluctuations and variations of it, that it must be due to something like a briny water and methane and ammonia solution that has ions that's swirling around with ice so that the ice causes disruptions and makes it flow in funny ways to give it all that variation. So that's the conclusion we have for the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune. Very odd, isn't it? Yes, yes it is, Richard. It's the right answer. Now on to this slide, Pluto. Pluto was demoted in 2006. Whoops, wrong, wrong pin. Actually, that would have been appropriate if I would have put it on Pluto just to erase Pluto. You know, it's not, not there anymore. In 2006, it was reclassified as a dwarf planet. Now, the people who wanted Pluto to stay a planet said, hey, still got the word planet, still a planet, 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 dwarf planet. The people who demoted it, say, yeah, we gave it a name to make you happy, but it's not like the planets. That's why it's changed to a different category. So the definition of planet was clearly defined then to make sure that Pluto couldn't be a planet. So the next slide, I'm going to look at the definitions of planet, but here's reasons that Pluto was removed from the list of planets. Not like the other planets in composition, size, or orbit. The other planets have two types, rocks or rocks with a lot of gas, right? Because the outer planets have rocks at the core that are also big rocks, like Earth-sized rocks. So all of the planets have big rocks. Pluto doesn't. Pluto, based on its density, we surmise that it is roughly half rock, half ice. So it's kind of a dirty ice ball. The same thing as a comet. Its size, Pluto is much smaller than the other planets. Its orbit, 
Pluto has what we call an eccentric orbit. What does eccentric mean? If you were to say Richard Webb is an eccentric guy, what would you be saying? Kind of what? Kind of like all over. Like oh, you're a little out there. You're a little different. A little different. <laughs> eccentric, a little different. In math, we have a precise definition for eccentricity. It's out of round. Something that's more eccentric is more out of round, more elliptical in shape, an elongated orbit. And so Pluto's orbit is elongated. So sometimes it's closer than Neptune, sometimes it's farther than Neptune. So we called it the outer planet, but it was the outer planet because on average it was the outer planet. But some of the time, Neptune was the outer planet. Well, now that it's been removed, Neptune's just the outer planet. You don't have to worry about that. Another thing is its plane of orbit. The other planets all orbit really close, like within about five degrees of the same plane going around the sun. I say about five degrees. Uh, Mercury is off by, it's something like 11 degrees off. But it's really close, so that's not very far out of the plane. It's just a bigger angle because it has a much smaller orbit. Well, Pluto is tipped significantly. So it's not in the same plane as the others. It's close, but not in the same plane. So there's some significant differences right there. Um, I've already talked about all of these things. Um, the other things that are like Pluto are not classified as plants. Take, for instance, I said Eris many times. Eris is an object like Pluto, except for much farther away, and bigger than Pluto. So Eris is like Pluto, but bigger, and nobody says Eris is a planet. Now some people said, let's consider Eris a planet and keep Pluto as a planet. So some people did suggest it. But there's lots of things out there that are of similar size to Pluto. You have Eris, Kolar, um, I think it's Hamamake, uh, the, there's at least one more <laughs> that I can't remember. Oh, I might have it come up slides. So it's not unique. And so it's been removed. So what's the new definition? Oh yeah, here's the list right here. Um, Make Make and Haumea. I think I was getting those two confused and wrapping them up into one name. They said something like Haumake or something like that. So they're named after Hawaiian gods. Um, Kualar, I think, is an Aztec god. It's not on this list. Um, because at least as of last year, I didn't check this year to see if it's finally been accepted. I don't think it has as a dwarf planet. But Kualar, I'm sure at some point will be accepted as a dwarf planet. Yes. And these are all in the same galaxy as ours. Like, yes, they're all orbiting the sun. They're all in our solar system. Ooh. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Or the solar system, but. Yes. So <clears throat> notice the KBO. KBO is a hyperbelt object. I talked about the Kuiper Belt. That is the icy objects that are orbiting in roughly the same plane as the planets, but further out. That's where the short light or the short return, excuse me, short period comets come from. So these are the things that KBO are the types of things that comets come are in a region that the short light or short period, I said it wrong again, um, comets come from. Ceres is an asteroid. Ceres is by far the largest asteroid. It's big enough that its gravity is formed into a sphere. It makes up, if I remember, something like 81% of the asteroid belt's mass. So most of the asteroid belt is that one asteroid. What's the definition of a dwarf planet? Three things. They have to orbit the sun and not be a satellite of another object. Satellite means it's orbiting something. So the moon is a satellite of the Earth. So they can't be orbiting something else. That rule there, that it can't orbit something else, plays into a little aspect of Pluto I'll talk about when I finish this. Have enough mass for gravity forming into a roughly spherical shape. Clearly Pluto meets this one. 
Pluto meets both of these two. The last one, dominate its orbit, has cleared the orbit of mass. So it's basically the only thing of significant mass orbiting the sun at that radius. Pluto has come nowhere close to that. And so it's by this last one that Pluto fails. Now scientists actually have made numbers that you can calculate for these two. Obviously this one here is just a yes, no answer. But they've made numbers for these two that you can calculate that show a clear distinction between the planets and Pluto. So what was the thing I was going to say about Pluto and another object having a satellite? Pluto has a moon. In fact, not just one moon. They found recently, by recently, I mean within the last five years, I think four more moons. So Pluto has a number of moons. And one of them is a large moon. Its large moon is Charon, C-H-A-R-O-N. I heard somebody pronounce it Karen recently. Um, I used to pronounce it Sharon because C-H-A-R. It makes sound like a red light Sharon. Its moon is like one third of its mass. So some people in this 2006 conference when they were deciding the fate of Pluto suggested Maybe Pluto and Karn should be accepted as a double planet, as two things orbiting each other that are planets orbiting each other. That was a proposition that was put forward. Now keep in mind, the vast majority of the scientists had already decided Pluto shouldn't be a planet. But there were a lot of people who liked Pluto. You know, after all, you've got the pooch at Disneyland that's named Pluto. You've got plutonium on the periodic table. We like, you like Pluto, right? Most people do. Okay, let's move on to a new topic, observing the night sky. Now, next school year, we'll be teaching astronomy. I'll be teaching astronomy. And at least one person here is planning on taking astronomy. Oftentimes, when people sign up for introduction to astronomy, this is what they think we're going to be focusing on on going out and looking at the sky. Now we do in lab. The laboratory astronomy class is devoted to observing the sky and thus the weather is poor. But astronomy is much more than just being able to point out constellations. It's about understanding what's going on out there. There's a reason astronomy is in the physics department called astrophysics often because you're applying physics ideas to what you see out there to try to explain it. But when you observe the sky, most of us are looking for these cool constellations and fun stories that go with them. So we have Ursa Major. What's odd about this bear, by the way? It has a tail. It has a tail, yeah. That's, that's an odd bear. I'm sure there must be some kind of bear that has a tail. Ursa Major means bear big. It's the big bear. So it's California on our flag we have. The California bear, the UCLA Bruins. The, yeah, there's lots of bear things in California. So the Big Dipper here is something that most people rec recognize. I'll draw the Big Dipper instead. I've been sitting here pointing at this. If you look at the presentation on YouTube, you're going to be like, well, you know. There's the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is called an asterism. You know what an asterisk is, right? What do you usually call it? What do you usually call that symbol? A lot of people, I think I heard, a lot of people just call it star. Because that's what aster means, star. So that asterisk is a little star symbol. And so an asterism is a little star picture. So the Big Dipper is a little star picture. It's an asterism. Now you might ask, what's the difference in that? A constellation. Well, here we have a bear. And you can see how the bear comes to be. You've got the front paw. You've got the two rear paws. You've got the tail. 
and you've got the backbone, and you've got one star there to represent the head. You can kind of see it. Well, back in the day, people made stories about what they see in the sky. And still today, people make stories. So if you belong to, let's say, American Indian culture, you would have had stories about the stars in the sky. They wouldn't be the same stories that we learned in astronomy class because the history of science goes between the Western world and, well, European Western world and the Arabic world and the Greek world. Right? They, well, Greece is part of Europe, right? But between those regions is where we get all of our current astronomy. So there was plenty of uh, stories and astronomy done in China by people in different cultures. But what we see in astronomy is from where the academic world was communicating back and forth. And so we have stories and pictures to go with these things. And it used to be that Ursa Major was defined by these stars. But now that is not so. Now Ursa Major is a region in the sky. Now that's not the right shape, but it's a specific region. And any star that's in that region is part of Ursa Major. Doesn't have to be part of the pictogram to be part of the constellation. The entire sky is filled by the constellations. There's 88 of them in total. And of those 88, I believe 48 are historical, and 40 were made to fill in the gaps. And so the ones made to fill in the gaps are things like triangulum. It's a triangle. Or microscopium. If you can see the microscope or microscopium, you're doing a lot better than me. Um, the ones with stories to them are more like, you know, um, Centaurus or Orionis. The names are in Latin for the constellations. Um, so, you know, you usually just say, Orion, it's yeah, just a different language. So we have those 88 constellations, 48 of them historical, 40 just filling space. Large reason for that is I think it's 80% of all humans live in the Northern Hemisphere. So the Northern Hemisphere was well covered with constellations. Southern Hemisphere, not so much because there's not that many people down there. And so the Southern Hemisphere is where you have most of the fill space type constellations. So when you observe the sky, here's something that always causes problems for astronomy class. We have the sun appearing to go around the earth as viewed from the earth. What's really going on, of course, is that the earth is going around the sun. The path the earth takes going around the sun we call the ecliptic. The constellations that are within plus or minus 18 degrees of the ecliptic, we give a special name. We call them the zoo or the zodiac. The zodiac is the constellations that are within plus or minus 18 degrees of the ecliptic. So zodiac is a term for astronomy. It's a specific set of constellations. And, of course, there is a pseudoscience that's related to the zodiac as well. So let's just talk about that pseudoscience for a minute, because after all, we're going to have a final exam in a week. And in that final exam, you're going to have to have the scientific method question, same questions you had in the first exam, except for it will be a different observation you'll be dealing with. So what's the first step of the scientific method, the simple one that we've learned in this class? Observe something interesting, make an observation. So I'm going to give you an observation for your application. You're just going to regurgitate that observation for step one. What's the second step? Create a hypothesis that fulfills three things. Makes testable predictions. Based on scientific ideas, which is the one I want to focus on here. What's the third one? It's actually the most obvious one, which is probably why you haven't said it. 
it means it needs to explain why the observation occurred. So your hypothesis needs to it, hypothesis means an educated guess. It's an educated guess that explains why what you observe happened based on scientific ideas and makes predictions that you can test. Step three is to test a prediction. Step four is if your test confirms your hypothesis, you go back and test differently. If your hypothesis is disproven by your test, you go back and revise the hypothesis. That's step four. So back to the hypothesis rules. Based on scientific ideas, let's explore astrology for a moment. Astrology, what's the starting point for astrology? Not sure? No, no, no. Like in, in, in what astrology is about, what's the starting point? The starting point for astrology is that where the sun is in the sky and where the sun was in the day you were born are going to say something about your life. You can make predictions about your life based on where the sun was when you were born and where it is now. And so you have your sign of the zodiac that is based on where the sun was when you were born. In theory. Now let's be real clear. I was born on November 13, 1966. November 13, 1966. If we were to look at where the sun is on November 13, 19, well, November 13, any old time. I'm pretty sure it's about there. It's, a, it's in the middle of actually, yeah. These pictures are well. It's not. It's not in the November window. And you're like what? It's, it's in the middle of Libra. Um, I think it's Libra. So we already have a failure right there because I'm a Scorpio. Now you look at any. Any astro astrology thing, and it'll say that I'm a Scorpio. But the sun wasn't in the constellation Scorpius when I was born. People who are true believers will say, well, yes, they take that into account. They know Scorpius doesn't really mean that it was a Scorpio. Well, why do we have that difference? Because there are 365.2422 days in a year. A circle has 360 degrees in it. Do you know why a circle has 360 degrees? Because the ancient people knew that there are 365 days a year, so the sun moves about 1 365th of a circle as observed by Earth per day. But the ancient guy said 365 is an uncool number. 360 is a Plato number because 360 is divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, not seven. Eight, nine, ten, not eleven, and twelve. So all but two of the integers from one to twelve will evenly divide 360. They said that must be a really powerful number. And so they said, let's put 360 days basically in a year to match, you know, that number for how much the sun that sun moves. So basically 360 degrees is an approximation for how much the sun moves in a day. But they knew that it was more than that. They knew it was 365 roughly. So calendars have 365 days in them. But if you have 365 days, every four years, your seasons are going to be shifting by one day. Because of that 0.24 part of the number of days in a year. And so slowly, the seasons are shifting as compared to the calendar. And so Julius Caesar... Well, during his reign, they came up with a calendar that took in, that into account. That calendar is called the Julian calendar, and the Julian calendar introduces a leap year. So in the Julian calendar, they had a leap year every four years. How ignorant. We don't do that anymore. Did you know we don't do that anymore? We have a much more complicated system. The problem with the Julian calendar is if you have... 
a leap day added every four years, then the Julian calendar has 365 plus one day every four years. Oh, come on. So that gives you 365.25 days per year on the calendar. Not bad, but do you remember how many days I said there actually are? No? 365.2422. So that means that every... Well, let's go with 100. Every 100 years, your calendar shifts by a day, approximately. And so over time, the calendar was shifting. And so around the 1700s, it depends on where you were when it was adopted, a new calendar, the Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory, was adopted. And the Gregorian calendar is different. The Gregorian calendar leap day every year divisible by four. And you should be saying, um, isn't that the Julian system? Not so fast, except skip in years divisible by 100. Remember I said about 100, <laughs> you're, you're gonna be off by about in one day in 100. Well, that's taking care of that. But then that would make it so you still have that point zero zero two two, And so we have one final exception, except don't skip in years divisible, oops, divisible by 400. That's the Gregorian system. So when people talk about a Julian calendar versus the Gregorian calendar, now you actually know what the difference is. It's how leap year is done. So the way this works, we'll, we'll do the math in just a second. If the year is divisible by four, like let's say 2016 or 2020, then you have a leap day added at the end of February. But if it's divisible by 100, like 2000, then you don't have a leap day, unless it's also divisible by 400, like 2000. So in my lifetime, there was no funny business because the year that was divisible by 100 in my lifetime was also divisible by 400, hence we still had a leap day in 2000. But you guys might make the 2100 where you'll skip leap day. And that's to keep the calendar so that it's keeping better time. If we calculate how many days in the year based on this system, we're going to have 365, our base number, plus one every four years, minus one every 100 years, plus one every 400 years. That's how many days you have in a year. Well, that's... 365 plus 0 0.25 minus 0 0.01 plus 0 0.0025 equals 365.2425 days per year. That's the Gregorian calendar. It's still not perfect. It's off by three in the... 10,000th place, 
But given the variations in the Earth's calendar, you know we have leap seconds every year. Did you guys know that? No. They, they add or subtract a few seconds every year to the clock based on variations in the Earth's um, orbit. So uh, given that variation, they figure this is good enough. It's, it's as good as we can reliably set a calendar system. So that's why we have leap years. All astronomy. Not part of what I planned on for the lecture, but it's all good. That's why my sign of the horoscope does not correspond to where the sun was in the day I was born. But like I said, the true believers say that's okay. The horoscope writers know this. And they base their horoscopes not based on where the sun, you know, what the name of the sign, but where the sun actually was in the day you were born. And if you go to somebody and have a personalized horoscope, they're going to look at, you were born on this day, the sun was in this location, they made it really specific to you. But why does this relate to our class at all? It's a pseudoscience. What makes it a pseudoscience? It's based on scientific measurements where the sun is as observed from Earth. Remember, in reality, the Earth is orbiting the sun. But as observed from Earth, where the sun is, that's a scientific measurement. The hypothesis that where the sun is affects your life is not based on scientific ideas. There is no scientific backing that says the, sun, the sun's position is going to affect your life. And so that makes it a pseudoscience. It's dealing with scientific measurements, but making predictions that are not based on scientific ideas. So scientists generally consider astrology a bunch of hokum. Your horoscope usually is so, so non-specific that you can always find something to match your horoscope. You know, something good's going to happen to you today. You know, like you'll get kicked in the head, but you won't break your skull, you know. See, you got kicked in the head, but you didn't break your skull. That was a good thing. You were lucky today. Horoscope was right, you know. They're, they're very non-specific. And thus, you can't prove them wrong because you can always find something to them. Because the Earth is rotating, if you go out and you look at the stars, and then you take a nap, and you look at the stars again, they're not going to be the same place. Up until we understood that the Earth was rotating, you would say, well, the sky moved. Now we still treat it that way, because from our perspective, it looks like the sky moved. But what we know is that the Earth rotated. We're constantly moving to the east. And so the stars that were on the east horizon, if you take a nap, they're going to be like overhead if you take a nap for eight hours. Eight hours? Eight times four is 32. No. You take a nap for six hours. The stars that were on the east horizon will be overhead because of the Earth's rotation. Now that does some interesting things. If you set your camera to look at the North Pole, and you have a long exposure, like an hour, you will see curves of the stars as the Earth rotates, and they all appear to be making a circle around the North Pole. Now, oddly enough, some flat Earthers have used this to say the Earth is flat. I don't know why. Somehow they think that that doesn't fit with the model of the Earth spinning, but, but it does. So, I, I don't know. You know, that's one of those things that I can't figure out there either. But that's, you, you've probably seen pictures of those star trails. And it's just because the Earth is rotating. And if you look at the center of those, that tells you where the Earth's axis is. When you look at the stars, like in, the constel in a constellation, here we have in the Big Dipper. And you can start practicing now. You have to learn... To name some stars, so you'll learn like Alcade, Mizar, Alias, Megres. Let's call it Fad today. The stars have names. What are those names? They're not English names. 
What language would you suspect those to be? It's actually not Greek, but it's not Latin. Constellation names are Latin, but the star names are, look at those owl. What language do you have lots of names of owl starting? Okay, that's not Egyptian, but Arabic. So these are Arabic names. Why? Because that's where the scholars were. And so they started naming the stars. So many of our stars have Arabic names. And it's funny, you know, you have al Qaeda, Mizar. Up about above Mizar, there is a faint set of stars. I say set of stars. About right here. And the names of those are... The names of them are, one name, Alcor. Well, Alcor and Alcade are actually originally the same name. They mean the rider. Mizar is a horse, and those are both the rider. Apparently, different people couldn't agree on which one's the rider. Alcor there is super interesting, though, know, because Alcor, I talked about before, is the double double. You have, when you look out at the telescope, you can see two stars there with that one white dot, as I put. But then when you look at the spectrum of light, you see the spectrum of light for each one of those, what looks like a star, is coming from two separate stars orbiting around each other. So that's two sets of stars going like this around each other. Totally cool. Well, the thing this here is for is not for you to know the names or even to know that. It's to know that those stars are not close to each other. This is showing how far away each star is. And if you look at this, Alioth is 360 light years away. It takes 360 years for light to go from Alioth to the Earth. Now that seems like a huge distance. As far as astronomy is concerned, that's pretty close. The closest one is next door, Megrez. Megrez, it only takes 53 years for light to reach us. The distance is called the light year, a light year means Distance that take well, the time it takes for light to travel that far is that many years. So those aren't close to each other at all, but their angles are close, and that's why we see them together as a grouping. So it's another important thing to understand: these stars are spread out all around us, and we're just looking. We see them in a direction; we don't really perceive their distance. How much light we perceive, yeah, that's important. These stars all give off a lot of light. That tells you the one that's farther away must be much brighter than the ones that are closer to still appear bright. The one that's closer doesn't have to be as bright. Here's another uh, time exposure showing those, well, here's an actual photograph. So you can see those star trails, which I, I tend to think these are very cool. You see the Earth here, the features on the Earth have stayed nice and constant. It's a long exposure, so you can see some detail there of the trees and even shadows. What's casting a, a shadow in this picture? You can't really see it there. It is there in the picture. It's just not bright enough. This picture actually looks a lot better in, in the original picture than it does on the projector. Um, you can see a little better there, but yeah, there's in the picture you can see clearer where shadow is and not shadow here, cast by the moon. So <clears throat> these are illustrations that the Earth is rotating. This, the temperature of a star is an important aspect of the star. Our sun has a temperature that's around 5,800 kelvins. Now, 5,800 kelvins, we talked about temperatures. That's a nice, toasty, hot temperature. Right? That would melt us fine. Dang. We, we would be burned up there. That's the temperature at the photosphere of the sun. That's what we see as the surface. There's no actual surface of the sun. 
If you go to the core, the temperature of the core of the sun is about 15 million kelvins. Super hot in the core. So we talked about the sun as a hot star, but compared to other stars, it's kind of an intermediate to cool star. Now, something you may or may not know is the colors versus temperature. That's not even red. Let's change this to red. There's red. So here's a red star. I don't like that color blue, I'm sorry. Do you see when I'm pulling up different colors here? I chose a different color of blue. Oh, well, not going to worry about it. Red and blue. If you have red and blue, like you go into a bathroom and it has one faucet that's blue and one that's red, which one's hot? That's because they taught us all wrong. Red is cool in temperature in reality. Blue is hot. I think they do that because, of course, fire is red and ice has a bluish tint to it. But in terms of temperature, red is cool and blue is hot. A blue star might be 30,000 kelvins for some of the very hottest stars, for type O's. Whereas red is cool, a red star might be around 2,500 kelvins. For, let's say, I think an M would be around there. So red is cool, blue is hot, and somewhere between those two, we have our star, which is a G. Be a little more accurate. Okay, Earth is actually a whitish color, or our, our sun, not Earth. Duh. Let me, let me shift things here. I'll put out here soul for the sun. White. I'm obviously not writing it in white because you wouldn't see it. So our sun is the intermediate temperature. Now, if things are hot, they're blue in color. So you can kind of tell the temperature of a star by looking at its picture. So let's look at these. Uh-oh, let's just answer the clicker question. Which of these is the hottest? Uh, no, I don't want to install software. There should be a way to tell it not to constantly hassle me. Uh, there. Which of these stars is the hottest? Is, is it requiring you to enter or? Excuse me? How many Kelvin's is the star? About 30,000. No luck, Leslie. All right, well, we had a six to one. Six said blue, which as, as Ashton clarified, is about 30,000 Kelvins. One said red, which is around 2,500 Kelvins. Let us be clear. 30,000 is hotter than 2,500. Violet technically is the correct answer because violet is a little bit on the hotter side of blue, but nobody ever talks about a violet star. So blue is what I expected you to answer. And on an actual test, I wouldn't put violet there because there's no point in confusing the issue. So blue would be the hottest. Yellow, we generally think of the sun as yellow because of the atmosphere. 
And so yellow is an intermediate color, and then red is cool color. And we're out of time. Makes me sad to be out of time. I love this stuff. Come join us next year. We'll do more. <laughs>